Tell us what you think, in person, over the phone, online. Watch and hear yourself on TV. You tell us, we air it. This is The Local Live. Hey everyone, welcome to the 26th episode of The Local Live. I'm Rebecca Berman. And I'm Alina Suriel. You're watching the only news show dedicated to Mamaroneck, Larchmont, and Rhineneck. Let's see what we have in store for you tonight. Later on, join Mike Witch with students from Amaranek and Rhineneck High Schools who will be discussing the LGBTQ issues. Stay tuned and see what students have to say. But first, let's show you a sneak peek of tonight's upcoming stories. Do you love hot dogs? Walters is in the spotlight. Want to know who is the LMCTV Volunteer of the Year? We have full coverage of LMCTV Award Night. And stay tuned for our Varsity Sports Play of the Week. Are you ready to surprise your dad on Father's Day? The local live was on the streets of Larchmont with this story. Who's the sweet little girl? Claire is looking for a new place to call home. This week's summary of the local news is brought to you in Mike Witches in the Media. Let's take a look. Congratulations to the Hamak Singers. Under the direction of Keo Matsushita, they took first place at the Lake Compounds Music Festival on Saturday, May 31st. That reported in the Hamlet Hub. And this month's Larchmont Ledger published a detailed account of legislator Catherine Parker's views on several topics. She addressed the local summit on May 20th and talked about Playland, the affordable housing settlement, and proposed legislation on clean air. As reported by Lynette Say, Parker also talked about taxes and gun control. A video of Parker's complete talk is online and on demand, courtesy of LMC-TV. The Breakfast Forum is hosted by the Larchmont Mamaroneck Local Summit. The next breakfast will be on Tuesday, June 17th. The topic, Our Pipes, What Lurks Below? about underground infrastructure like sewer lines, storm drains, and the like. The speakers will be Stephen Altieri, Ann McAndrews, and Richard Slingerland. It's at the Nautilus Diner. All are welcome, and the cost is $8 for breakfast. In the patch, Larchmont Mamaroneck Student Aid Fund has its 2014 awards ceremony on Monday, June 16th at 7.30. The community is invited to the Pace Center at Mamaroneck High School, where 50 graduating seniors will receive two-year college scholarships. Dr. Richard Greenwald is the featured speaker. He's the Dean of Humanities and Social Sciences at Brooklyn College and a contributor to Generation Student. This year, the Student Aid Fund gave $300,000 in scholarships to the class of 2014. As reported in the Daily Voice, the Larchmont Historical Society will be offering a spring afternoon filled with beautiful historic homes, gardens in full bloom, and culinary delights locally sourced from Larchmont's finest restaurants and gourmet shops. It all happens on June 22nd. From 1 o'clock, you can visit five homes on the house and garden tour where local historians and gardening experts will be on hand to talk about the homes, the gardens, and the luminaries who lived in them. At 3 o'clock, you can join the garden party at a century-old home in Larchmont Manor. There will be music and wine and food from local restaurants, even an art exhibit. All tickets are available at larchmonthistory.org. Finally, from the Mamaroneck Public Relations Office, congratulations to the computer team of Peter Solomon, Yi Zhao, and Hector Gattaca. They came in first place at the NYU Poly Innovation Competition, besting Park Place Academy and Stuyvesant High School. The boys are mentored by Mr. Jadav, who teaches computer science and robotics. MHS competed among nine schools presenting 12 projects. The competition challenges students from across the globe to prototype and pitch commercially viable ideas for real-world problems. With Mr. Jadav, the students spent months developing a computer program to help strengthen a football quarterback's rapid cognition and motor response, ultimately improving his game. Mamaroneck will receive $500 for placing first and get invited to join NYU's summer launch pad program, a 10-week intensive. Peter Solomine will be the only high school student among those graduating NYU poly seniors. And those are some of the stories that caught my eye this week in the media. I'm Mike Witch.
Stay tuned, the local life will be right back. <coughs> Good evening, I'm Michael Witch, and with me is Maura Carlin. On this edition of The Local Live, we address LGBT issues in our schools. The acronym stands for Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender. A recent op-ed in the New York Times calls attention to some of the challenges faced by the LGBT community. About 10% of the general youth population, for example, bullying, homelessness, and transgender inequality. Before we introduce our guests, a word about how you can join the conversation. That's right, Mike. To comment or ask a question, call us at 381-0150. You also can send us an email or a tweet. The phone number, email address, and tweet will appear on screen for your convenience. Our guests are from Rhinec as well as Mamaroneck High School. First, I'd like to introduce Emily Dombroff, who's a film production teacher and also the advisor to the high school GSA. And next to her is Sam. Uh, Sam, I, goodness sakes, <laughs> your last name is not on the prompter, and it is Espada. 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 Yes, I'm sorry about that. And you are the president, or the co-president, I'm sorry, of the GSA at Rhinec High School. Well, welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as you probably know, June is Pride Month, uh, LGBT Pride Month. Can we start with um, just explaining the, uh, the, the, the uh, acronym? Uh, because some people put a Q at the end of that. Q stands for? Questioning. Okay. Questioning, and sometimes I've heard it can be queer also. Have yeah. you heard that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so lesbian, gay, LGBT, lesbian, <laughs> bisexual, gay, whatever the order, transgendered, <laughs> yeah. and questioning. So we have students, and I think Sam also said before we started mm -hmm. today that she has students at their school as well who don't, they either are questioning, they're not sure yet, or... They don't identify as anything at this point in their life, which would be different than, than questioning. And the GSA, Sam, stands for what? The Gay Straight Alliance. Mm -hmm. And uh, the straight part of it means that this is not an organization for students who are LGBT. Yeah, we get a lot of allies. It just means that you're in support of the LGBT community. You feel that they should have equal rights, things like that. And um, I definitely think it's more of like a these people can have a safe zone in our school, so we just want to be their friend mm -hmm. and share that they can be open about anything about that. Well, Emily, can you talk about the GSA at uh, Mamarina? Can you tell me some of the things that you've been working on this year? Sure. So we had a really, we had a really great year. Um, and speaking to Sam before, we did a lot of the same things. So one of the big things that we did, I think it was in March, was mm -hmm. the Pride Works um, LGBT Youth Conference, which was at Pace University in Westchester. Um, and students could attend different workshops throughout the day, different workshops on sexuality, gender, coming out, things to do with religion. Mm -hmm. um, we went to a GSA roundtable, ways to create more you know, inclusive schools and conversations for teachers, parents. So it was a really, for our kids overall, it was a really positive experience. And just for the day to be around kids like them, I think was probably the best part about well, it. Well, this wasn't planned, but I'm glad you brought that up because we actually have a clip from a video that was produced at that uh, Pride Works conference. And it starts with one of the organizers, Matt Tennis, uh, talking about um, the event and also uh, Dale, who was our uh, keynote speaker, is in there as well. Can we take a look at that clip? It lasts for one minute. This is Pride Works from March at uh, Pace University. LGBT people are still feel sort of isolated and so the conference gives them a place where they can sort of come together with 500 people who are either like them or support them. What's wonderful about Pride Works and being asked to come back is it's a reminder for me that as a child or as a kid their age, uh, we didn't have things like this that openly supported LGBTQ youth. So for me, Pride's work is a, a reliving of my childhood. It's a, it's an affirmation that uh, all this time spent out in the world being an openly gay kid, uh, these kids have the open, active benefit of being able to celebrate it in a whole unified sense with their own community, with their friends, uh, and they can celebrate 
celebrated with pride and support from their teachers and their allies. Well, that was just a little bit of the Pride Works Conference, which actually attracted almost 500 people from all around Westchester and Rockland County. And um, Sam, you were there as well? Yeah, it's actually my third conference. Um, I, started G I started being a part of GSA my s sophomore year, and I've mm -hmm. gone every year since. And um, it's honestly an amazing experience. I think that it teaches you so much. Like, coming in as a sophomore, I had no clue what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. And um, I really didn't know anything about this community or how to get involved. And when I got to do that with my GSA, it was such an amazing experience. And they really teach you everything you need to know. It's kind of like a crash course in anything you want to know. Mm -hmm. So I've been to things as easy as just how to be an ally to as things as complicated as um, what it means to be a transgender or um, how LGBTQ kids are now adapting in society and sports. And Emily, the, uh, some of the co uh, workshops are specifically for the advisors, yeah. for the adults. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. so that was actually really great for me. This was my third year as the advisor, but sort of my first year taking more of like the main role, mm -hmm. and I'm going to do it by myself next year. Um, so it was just nice to sort of hear other teachers' experiences and um, that, you know, positive things and things that we're, we're still sort of trying to improve are not unique to our school and that, mm -hmm. you know, membership and leadership sort of, you know, waxes and wanes every year. And so Sam was sort of talking about that as she graduates, you know, what's going to be coming up for the next group of kids and who are going to be the new leaders. So it was, it was great. We kind of, I kind of left with tons of ideas of sort of how to recruit for next year and, and keep, keep the momentum. Well, somebody actually um, wrote in a question wanting to know if there are men, if the Westchester Middle and High Schools, if there are many LGBT groups, you know, do most schools have them in the county? <laughs> I find that there are so many, even just talking to things as close, like going to Pride Works, right. you get to see all of the GSAs right. that combine and you get to, even just talking to Center Lane, which mm -hmm. is an organization that promotes, um, different activities in the LGBTQ community and like for they organize yes, for youth, for youth. Yeah. and they organize gay prom mm -hmm. and things like that and you get to see all these schools and you really communicate with all of them and you create like a networking system right. of sharing events and sharing ideas and even if you're not always talking to them you know they mm -hmm. exist and you feel comfortable knowing that your whole community and this whole Westchester County is really involved well, one, someone named Laura asks how the schools support LGBT students. And so why don't we focus on how does Mamaronek sure. and how does Rynek, mm -hmm. I guess the high schools, support sure. the students? Well, probably one way of supporting the students would be to have a GSA, right. to allow a GSA right. to exist. And I think in this area, it's, it's no problem. But in other areas right. of the country, uh, having a GSA sometimes well, results in all of the clubs being Right. Is it really no out? problem? Um, it's not a problem, in the Maronek at least, I'm, I'm sure it's the same for Rye, it's not a problem to start a club. If a student, if there's student interest, the club will exist. Um, I think for me as a teacher, like my involvement and how I, there was a shift for me in my involvement this year, um, and other years I've sort of sat back and let the kids do a lot, lot of it, and I think this year I saw that like I was in a position to really push a little bit and take more of a leadership role in addition to working with the kids. So I think that sort of helps. I think it does need to start with teachers. I think that we're spe up there speaking for most of the day and that if something happens, like while students can be in a position to be upstanders and to speak out, I think it really does start with teachers. Um, there needs to be visibility, there needs to be conversations and language that's being used that promotes mm -hmm. inclusiveness and that students feel that they're not alone and that they they are going to feel supported. I have a safe, sp safe space sticker on my door, um, and kids know that it's a place where they can be who they want to be and that you know people are not going to bully them. Um, Sam and I were talking before about teachers promoting, being, promoting themselves as allies. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. Um, actually, for Ally Week, we have a whole week dedicated the same week that the National Ally Week is. And what one of the things that we do is during the week we go around to all of the teachers in the high school and we ask them if they'd be willing to we read them the pledge statement of you know ally week and all that stuff mm -hmm. and we ask them if they're willing to be an ally and if they are to put a sign up on their window and on front of their classroom and so you go down Brynick High School and you go down the hallway during ally week and every single teacher has an I am an ally sign up on the door. Just kind of showing kids that this really is a safe zone and we've come so far as a club. I think we've almost been here 10 years now at Rynek and 
you know, you really have so much, so there's a really big support system and everyone's really willing to listen and willing to learn. I think that's really important. We should add too that the idea of an ally week and day of silence, mm -hmm. uh, transgender day of remembrance, these are national programs that were started by GLSEN, right, yeah. which is a big organization uh, throughout the United States. It's the Gay, Lesbian, Straight Education mm -hmm. Network, mm -hmm. I believe. And they have helped to um, raise awareness and design these programs that GSAs can then right. implement in their own schools. I do want to just add one thing and then I'd like to talk about Day of Silence. Um, I do think you know, that it's great that the teachers are you know, being visible as allies, mm -hmm. but I also feel like it has to go beyond that, that it's amazing that the teachers are wearing the t-shirts on those days and putting up the stickers, but, you know, that could also mean when a student says something that's offensive that mm -hmm. the teacher is stopping the lesson to yeah. make it a teachable moment, um, or that they're discussing current events, or if they're a history teacher, they're including gay history in the lesson, even if it's for a day or stopping or to tell an anecdote, but I think like teachers have to create the conversations or look at look for opportunities to create the conversations. Um, but day of silence is definitely a day where that conversation can be started. A lot of people don't even know what it what it is. Um, so we ran um, a PSA, a public service announcement, produced by our students in the GSA, sort of explaining the day. So the day of silence mm -hmm. is um, a national movement where students take a vow of silence symbolically to to um, to create awareness about the silencing effect of anti LGBT bullying and harassment in schools. Um, so we, so we have some, I brought some pictures, oh there they are. So we uh -huh. uh, had the P PSA run, we talked to students about how they can be involved and show their support and that meant you know, taking a pledge to stop the silence and to stand up for others. So students would write mm -hmm. um, different ways that they're gonna do that and then we posted them on our wall um, in the school and I think, Sam, you guys did that at Rye also? Yeah, um, at Rye we actually do something similar. We kind of combine our Ally Week with Day of Silence, and that's just in order to really get that whole full picture of what we do as a club in one week. And what we do is at the beginning of the week, we have a big homeroom meeting with all of the high school, and we explain what we're going to do every day of the week. And on that Friday, it'll be the Day of Silence. And mm -hmm. by the end of the week, what we like to do is we go around to the homerooms and we pass out the Why Am I an Ally cards. We've kind of created that of our own. And um, we get every everyone who wants to to write why they are an ally, and we put them on our board afterwards. So you mm -hmm. really see the support. And um, I think what's also incredible is I've had a lot of people this year tell me, well, can I put why not on my card? Because it's become such a commonplace thing to be an ally at this school that people don't know why they're not an ally. They just know that they are. So. When I was in uh, school as a teacher, uh, the most common thing I would hear in the hall from students casually is, that's so gay. And it wasn't meant as a put down, but it was taken as a put down by people who were gay or questioning. And it happens mm -hmm. in the younger mm -hmm. levels of school, I mean mm -hmm. on the playground all the time, right. and it is meant as an insult mm -hmm. by right. kids who have no idea of anything about sexuality. Right. How can we... I assume you want to change that dialogue. Yeah, the dialogue has to be why are we using that word to mean stupid, weak, less than, you know. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. they, to me, saying I don't mean it that way is not an excuse, and I make students know that. Um, so, you know, think about the word. You wouldn't go around saying that's so. I could insert a lot of other words that would be incredibly offensive to minority groups um, or groups that don't fit into the norm. So I think it's, again, that's a moment as a teacher where you have to say something and you can't just say, don't say that. I think you have to say, think about what you're saying. And again, it's, it's not just for me to walk away with my integrity as a teacher to know that I said something, but what about the students in my class who are gay or questioning? And then so they're being connected to and associated with something that's weak, stupid, you know. It's what like do you saying, think like, parents like, should do? And I, and I don't mean parents of necessarily gay students, just parents in general. What should they do? I think you need to change the dialogue. I think that if you hear something like that in general, like you need to say something. And I think as a parent, that needs to be established. Like if you hear your child saying something like that, just have a discussion about what that actually means and what that means to someone. And I think it, it'll make a difference. I think just putting a little trigger mm -hmm. in someone's mind saying, that's what I'm associating mm -hmm. that with, I don't mean to do that, so let me change right. that. And mm -hmm. language is a very hard thing to unlearn, so I think it is, you know, giving kids a break, not coming down hard on them, mm -hmm. but I have my students catching themselves, and that's better than them not, not catching themselves at all. So it's but like baby every, steps. But not every parent is comfortable to the point where they can talk about that. 
Great. And I think that's why we mm -hmm. need schools to do right. it. Mm -hmm. I think that that's why we need students to do it. I think that you need Can a parents be members of GSAs. Do you have a parent contingent? We don't. We don't. There were but, parents but at Pride Works, like, and one of my yes, workshops, yeah. a parent just said, "My student, my my son is, you know, questioning, and I'm just here to support him," which yeah. was pretty awesome. That's why individuals can be a part of Pride Works. Like, right. you can sign up on your own. Anyone can. Anyone can right. want to come, and right. so I think that that's why they want to do it. They want to make it aware for everyone. Right. Hmm. I mean, I I would would not be opposed to parents coming to the GSA. I don't know if their kid was in the GSA, if they would be okay. <laughs> Well, that, that's a whole other thing. <laughs> but they can come if they want. Now, you also had a guest speaker coming. Oh, yeah. Um, so I got put in touch. I, I received an email from this, this guy, um, and I was put in touch with him through mutual people within the school. Um, his name is Blake Scalarup. He's an Olympic speed skater from New Zealand, and he's openly mm. gay. He, um, he plays 16th in the world at, at Vancouver, and he's since retired. He didn't place in Sochi for Sochi, um, but he's now sort of devoted his time to speaking. He did a whole tour in New Zealand, and Mamaroneck was actually his first school in the United States that he's spoken. So, okay. um, there, yeah, him? there are some there pictures of him okay. speaking. We mm -hmm. had a lunchtime open assembly for any students who wanted to to sign up. And we had mm -hmm. a nice group of kids. Um, he sort of told his story, reinforced a lot of what we're trying to do in Mamaroneck, which again is in, is really promote an environment of inclusion and visibility. Why is it important that a sports person oh well that's speaks right to students. So that's, I mean, sports is a place where sort of, I think, anti-LGBT language is sort of rampant. Um, I think you hear it all the time. Even things like you're throwing like a girl. I mean, just to think about what that, what or the implications the fact that are. I play softball and everyone has to call it dyke ball. Or the, like only dykes mm -hmm. play softball. Like that's right. such a ridiculous stereotype. Right. And things like that are just come associated with sports because you feel like when you play a sport, there needs to be this huge masculinity a part of it. Right. And so females who play sports, if they're not wearing a skirt, they must be right. something else. Right. I mean, I think it's funny because I'd never heard that at Mamaroneck, but I know like on the, you know, I, I you just hear things that I think it, there is this sort of alpha male, you know, expectation for, for athletes. Um, what's kind of amazing right now, and I, I sort of tried to explain this to my students and also to promote them coming to hear our speaker, I mean, this is a really big moment right now in professional sports. It's just in the past, like, two years. If you look at, yes. the, you know, like, the timeline of civil rights for other groups and how many years and how long it's taken, like, what's happened in the past just five years with marriage equality, but now also in the past year with sports, it's a it's a big deal what's happening now. So again, he's talking about visibility. The more athletes that come out, the less of an issue it's going to be. So I think it's that's sort of the goal. I, I, I firmly believe that if you know everybody came out tomorrow, the gay civil rights um, struggle will be over. So I think visibility is mm -hmm. huge. I completely agree, and I think the funny thing is, is that when you're thinking about these things, everyone, let's be honest, how many kids look up to politicians or somebody like that that wants to come out, but how many kids look up to athletes? So you see an athlete come out and you create this open environment that people are just, as soon as athletes start to come out and it becomes a social norm in athletics, I think it'll become a social norm in our society, especially how we praise athletics. Yeah. It's just a culture mm -hmm. that I think is is going to shift. It's just going to be slow. Absolutely. But again, the more people that come out, we had talking about allies. We had like a lot of athletes this year. One student in particular who really saw, you know, he was an ally, a football player, really recognized sort of this position of privilege that he was in, and became sort of outspoken for for our GSA um, in terms of on the on the football field and speaking to his coaches and speaking to fellow players and and talked about he, how there was a slow shift. I mean, kids started to change the way they spoke. You know, so mm -hmm. these are kids. Again, Again, they just needed to be reminded. They just needed to be told. I think mm -hmm. they didn't mean it in any way, but I think, you know, once they're aware, like, oh, what I'm saying has 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 I'm affecting what I'm. I, I want to ask you about your plans for uh, next year, but we only have a few minutes left. And we actually have a question. Okay, I just wanted to remind oh. people that if they had a comment or question, now's the time. Uh, we do have a question emailed in. How can parents support their children that if they're being teased at school because of se sexual orientation? How can parents support them? I mean, I think, I think parents can support their children by accepting their children and telling their children that they can be whoever they want to be. I mean, I think it has to start there, but then I think, you know, schools are sort of microcosms for the world, we would think, so we would hope that teachers can also send that message. Again, it's like, as a teacher, I feel like we're in a very unique position to be as supportive as a parent would be. I think parents need to accept their kids. They're their yeah. kids, you know? So do to the, me, that's that's a no-brainer. Do the GSAs mm -hmm. help students who want to tell their parents find the words or ways? Um, I'm, I don't take that position because I think, you know, I don't feel 
not th I mean, not that I'm not qualified, but my experience as a, as a as a per you know as a person is different than everybody else's. So those are sorts of situations that I would refer students to, you know, their guidance counselors, or social workers. I mean, we're it would if I wasn't the advisor of a GSA and a student approached me about doing that, I wouldn't feel comfortable doing it because of my relationship with the student. So it's better what about for at Reinach? Um Actually, I think that. I think that what we've done is that people have been able to share their own stories, and I think that that's helped other people, especially with things like being a bisexual and coming out for some, I know some students who have tried to come out with that, that's a weirder topic, because it's not like, I like this, but telling your parents that you're not really sure what you like, but you are sure that you like both of them, is weird. And so I think having our school psychologist is actually our advisor, and I think that's really helpful, because if anything, she can always take charge of a discussion, and and say how she can go about this from her perspective. And I think that that not only provides the educational aspect of it, but it also, you have support system in your peers. Okay, and, Emily, any big idea for next year? I mean, um, just in talking to Sam for the half hour I was here before I got here, there were like lots of ideas about recruitment. I mm -hmm. think there, there needs to be a push to recruit more allies, but I also think there are kids who think, I've, I've heard, just walking in my door at lunch is people are going to think mm -hmm. they're gay. That just by stepping in the room, yes. it's, they're mm -hmm. going to be identified. So I think there needs to be um, more of a conversation of what the club is. It's not you're committing to being this or that. It's just a place where we can have an open conversation. You can, it's a safe space um, for you to be who you want to be and, and be part of the conversation. And Sam, a plan for next year? Um, Anything big coming up? <laughs> um, well, Boost the membership, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I think we're definitely, I think we've got a strong group of juniors who are now going to be our officers, and I'm excited mm -hmm. to see that happen. But I think that it's also important that we've recently changed our mission statement to include all discrimination and all types of bullying. And it doesn't have to just be the LGBTQ members or allies. It can be anyone. And so I think that that's kind of promoted more recruitment, and I hope that that will continue as future years come. Well, I also saw something here. You two were talking to each other, and we're neighboring high school, so yeah. idea sharing. I got the email yeah. address. I'm saying <laughs> Terrific. next year. Terrific. Well, we're out of time oh, for wow. this segment, but I thank you both for coming on. Thanks, and thanks for having us. Come back again, and we'll, we'll talk some more. Sure. And we mm -hmm. will be back with more community stories after this short break. Hi, I'm Westchester County Legislator Katherine Parker. Watch The Local Live on Thursday at 7.30, before I make it a law. For the first time since 1993, the Rhineck baseball team has, was one away from reaching the state Final Four. With one swing of the bat, Ryan Aquino gave the Panthers all the momentum they needed in the LMC TV Varsity Sports Play of the Week. Bottom half of the second inning, about to get underway. Ryan Aquino will lead things off. And this kid is a gamer, Sam. And he drills oh. one in the air to left field. Forget it. Goodbye, Ryan Aquino. Wow. A strained tendon in his left foot. Pitched a complete game three hitter yesterday. Despite that, he can barely, uh, he was limping around the field yesterday. And now he drills one way over the wall and left. That kid is a gamer. You don't see that every day. <laughs> Right in the middle of that historic game, former Rhineck pitcher, Ryan, former Rhineck pitcher Ryan Pennell received news that he was selected by the Tampa Bay Rays in the Major League Baseball draft. Ryan was picked in the 22nd round, the 667th overall pick. In attendance at the game, he watched his younger brother, Chris, strike out the final two batters to secure their victory and their spot in the final four. LMCTV caught up with Ryan after the game. David Price is the best pitcher, <laughs> one of the best pitchers in the league. So I'm really excited just to see like how they develop, and uh, they're definitely really good at developing pitchers. So I couldn't be more excited to be in this situation. Number 12, Justin Castanelli is set down on the high cheddar by Ryan Pinnell. Uh It's pretty surreal; it hasn't really set in yet. But I'm just extremely excited, and really words can't describe it right now. And I'm just glad I could be here with my whole family and all my friends too. That was awesome. So couldn't ask for anything better. 
Walter's hot dog. Ma Walter's hot dogs makes a comeback. Don Julian has the story. Not many people get to eat at a national landmark, but if you head to Walter's hot dog stand on Palmer Ave, you may get the chance. After closing during the winter for renovations, Walter's Hot Dog Stand, a national historic landmark, is back in business for spring. We were closed for four months and then we recently reopened on May 2nd and um, that weekend we saw more foot traffic than ever. With so much foot traffic, Catherine breaks down Walter's menu. Obviously the highlight here is our hot dogs. Um, we have a single hot dog, which is a hot dog split right down the middle and grilled in our special sauce. Um, we have a double hot dog, which is two singles on one bun, uh, which is a popular, popular item. And then we also have a puppy dog, which is half of a hot dog. Um, a lot of people get that for kids or as a snack or if they're just trying to eat something light. Our hot dogs um, have been our recipe since 1919, since we opened. It's a recipe that um, Walter, my great-grandfather, came up with. Uh, the hot dogs are a blend of pork, veal, and beef. And then we also have our house-made mustard, um, which is our own recipe. We also bottle that and sell it here as well as online. And that's a mustard relish blend that we make here. The food is so good, it's no wonder Walter's customers have been so loyal for so many years. How long you've been going to um, Walter's well, Hot Dog Stand? I'm turning 70 in a couple of days, and so that's how long. Wow. Uh, well, we, we'd probably say 69. I probably didn't have Walter's Hot Dogs when I was an infant, <laughs> but um, my mother also uh, was born and raised on Walter's Hot Dogs. I used to live here like 50 years ago and I went to high school with Christine and uh, I make a trip to, I live in Tokyo now and I come to New York like a couple times a year and every time I come, this is the place I come. So how did Walters come to be? Walter and my grandmother Rose started a roadside stand on Boston Post Road and they sold apples and cider and hot dogs and drinks. And then in 1928, they were able to purchase this piece of property and he had an architect design the Chinese pagoda and he established the business here in 1928. So we've been in business quite a while. Even after all these years, Walters continues to be the go-to hangout spot. Okay. It's been 70 doggone oh, yeah. years. <laughs> this is Don Julian reporting for The Local Live, signing off. This past Tuesday, June 10th, LMC TV hosted its 24th annual award night. Attention all volunteers, check out how much we appreciate you and the contributions you made for us. It's a time of the year where LMC TV honor the volunteers for the amount of hours they give to our community. So what songs are you playing us? Well, songs from the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, all the latest hits. So uh, it's sort of an alt-comedy talk show, and it's all scripted and uh, wacky. Who are you guys going to dedicate the award for uh, Best Single Program, if you guys win? Uh, I'm going, uh, we're actually nominated for New Series. Oh, I apologize. Best New Series? Okay. Uh, I, did, I would dedicate it to all of the roadkill that's ever been killed on that road over there. What about you? My mom. You? Uh, Nick Viagas. His mom. Beautiful. Okay. Welcome everyone to the 24th Annual Award Night. I don't know if you realize how competitive these award nights are because um, compared to the Tonys, look at the venue we have here. I understand that Madison Square Garden after the Rangers lost last night was begging Eric to host this show down in Madison Square Garden tonight to bring some cheer to the garden. But he was loyal to the VFW Post and he's continued to have it here. And we want to thank the Town of America Senior Center, VFW Post number 156, Maria Gallagher and Steve Altieri for hosting this space. Thank you very much. Without volunteers, you know, we'd be dead in the water. And basically, it's, it's a way of honoring everybody that works with us. And, you know, and it's a big, it's, it's a, this is our 24th? Yeah, the 24th annual award night. So it's been a long tradition. The message I'd give to the volunteers is that without you guys, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. Uh, we are, are solely uh, de dependent on your contributions. And uh, it's incredible to see every day people come in 
and just donate so much time and effort and their talent. So to you guys, thank you. This night is about you, and uh, I just want to say that uh, we hope to see you for many more years to come. Someone like Xavier, you know, he started last year and now he's going to be, you know, he does paid work for us now because he actually pushed himself to learn more and like, hey, how do you do that? And it's just, yeah, I'll show you how to do that if you want to learn it. So he just is increasing his skill level um, and just seeing that type of growth is amazing. And it's really evident, even like with the young, young volunteers, like someone like, Andre or Asher that have come in from when they were like this high and then they go through growth spurts they're this high but like all the knowledge that they have now because they started with us so young is astronomical and they're just great. This year's winner of the Volunteer of the Year Award is Xavier Campo. Please come up and receive your award, Xavier. Hey everybody. Uh, I'd just like to say uh, it's a great honor to serve this community. Um, I've learned a lot. Uh, not only behind the camera and editing, but uh, people skills, and uh, I got to meet, <coughs> I get to work and meet great people in every event, and um, I just very proud to be part of this team. Uh, I hope LMC TV is here for forever. <laughs> Why do you guys volunteer at LMC TV? Why do you come here and work, and nobody pays you, but you just come and work? Why do you do that? Well, I think that LMC is very fun and it's a great way to spend a community service because you're not just um, sitting around and, teach, and teaching people, you're actually having an interactive way and you're actually helping your community um, during a, with a fun way, so that's why I love volunteering. Yeah. Next year I, I plan to be nominated for three awards, but uh, Scriptless is the best one uh, and I'm acting in it. My father, who's 99 years old, he's acting in it too. Great. LMC TV is such a great resource for um, learning about video and um, re uh, news reporting and, uh, and pretty much just all the events and how to record and um, document um, the daily life of people that live in this community. To congratulate Roseanne. Roseanne uh, is typical of the hardworking and dedicated people that are employed by the Village of Marinick. They are more than employees. She came up with ideas that will continue on, such as the family fun night, uh, the Christmas parties, and so on. Just a phenomenal person, so she will leave her an indelible mark for many years to come. Congratulations, Roseanne. Thank you for all the hard work you've done for the village, both as an employee and volunteering, everything from uh, Mrs. Claus to running an entire department. So uh, thank you very much. It's wonderful to be recognized and noticed, and it definitely put a big smile on my face. So thank you so Maybe much. You need to show your award to the camera. Oh my, here it is. It's so that's, that's so pretty. It is pretty. We are proud to announce this year's recipient of the Val Estabrook Award for outstanding work in school video, and that is Audrey Gordon. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is really you. unexpected. Um, the, thank you, Alan, for doing your show. That's it's great. <laughs> the, the local live is amazing. And, and um, Dina for the um, motions in history. This was definitely a night to remember for volunteers, for winners, and for our community. On behalf of all the staff, we want to say congratulations and thank you, volunteers, for all the work that you do for LNC TV. This is Sheila Navarro for The Local Live, signing off. This week, The Local Live hit the streets of Larchmont to ask people what they are doing for this upcoming Father's Day. Siobhan Flattery was in the village of Larchmont to get the story. Let's watch the tape. Father's Day is the one day out of the year that we get to take a step back and acknowledge and honor all the great dads out there. With the day quickly approaching, we wanted to see what the community's plans were to celebrate Father's Day. Father's Day, I'm going to have a, I'm going to go to the movies with my dad and have a nice lunch and we're going to have a nice day together. Um, the World Cup starts tomorrow and my husband's from England, so we're having a big World Cup party on Saturday and we're celebrating Father's Day then and my father is coming and we're gonna have a great time. 
For Father's Day, let's see, the father of my four children, Michael, uh, his wish is to go fishing in Debruce in, by Livingston Manor. And so he's a fly fisherman and that's what we're going to do. One son lives in Brooklyn, so I know he's coming home. He's coming home to Saturday night, so they could. And I'll do whatever they want me to do. But it's all, all I ask for is just simple. I was even thinking of something to do to take them out. And I'm like, you know, just the one day relax. Even if we just had breakfast and relax, that's a simple thing. Well, that about wraps things up here. On behalf of LMC TV and The Local Live, I want to wish all you dads out there a happy Father's Day. I'm Sean Flattery, reporting for The Local Live. Here we have Claire, a one-year-old female hound mix who is in the need of a new home. Claire's name is an acronym standing for cuddly, loving, agile, ready for a family, and eager to please. She's very good with adults, dogs, and even cats. She loves to make new friends and is looking for a family with another dog where they can enjoy big open spaces together. If you'd like to adopt Claire, please contact Pet Rescue at Pet Rescue New York at AOL.com or call 914-834-6955. Hey guys, you're watching The Local Live. Stay tuned. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we seem to have run out of time, folks. Thanks for coming to us for your weekly community rundown. That's right, Rebecca. We're always excited to keep you up to date on what's happening in Larchmont, Mamaroneck, and Rhineneck. I'm Rebecca Berman. And I'm Melina Suriel. We'll see you next time here at The Local Live. Tell us what you think. In person, over the phone, online. Watch and hear yourself on TV. You tell us. We Aaron. This is the local live.